is the Lord God Almighty. Amen. 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 Hey, join me in prayer this morning. Father, we do. We celebrate that. And God, for those of us who know Christ, who are saved, God, we will be singing that anthem for tens of thousands upon thousands of years, for all eternity. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And so, God, thank you that we can gather as a church to lift up our eyes, to stop looking at the things of the world, to stop looking at the things that are happening around us, and for us to look up, to look beyond this life to the life to come. And so, Father, I pray this morning that every soul who will spend eternity somewhere will be impacted this morning. Those watching online, those here with us on campus, that God, you would do immeasurably more this morning than we've ever asked or could even imagine. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the resurrection. We have life and hope and freedom and joy and forgiveness because of Jesus. And so, God, I pray that in all things this morning, Christ, you would be lifted up and you would draw all people to yourself. Those who are lost today would be saved, and those who are saved would be drawn deeper into more faithful obedience and worship because of this morning. God, we pray that you would impact eternity. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, you may be seated this morning. A few things that I want to remind you of. First, again, as, as Pastor Breck already shared, we're so glad all of you are here. We don't believe anyone's here by accident, and so we are so excited to be able to welcome everyone here this morning. And if you are a first-time guest, listen, my name's Blake, and I'm so excited that you're here. And so please take a quick moment to fill out the back page uh, of the Stay in the Know. And uh, I, I tell people that we call those first-time guests every week, and, and I do. Matter of fact, I give you a quick funny story uh, that I was cleaning out my truck. Uh, this last week, and I found a Connect With Us sheet from June 26 this summer from a young lady named Katie who came to our church in June, and I totally, I don't know how it got in there and just got lost, but it did, and so this week I called Katie, and I was like, Katie, I'm so sorry, but I'm so glad you came and visited our church in June, okay? So uh, we really do. We call those sheets when we get them, and so make sure to fill that out. We, we really appreciate it and, and want to connect with you, and so a couple of things that we've got this morning coming for us as a church that I want to make you guys aware of. Uh, first and foremost, always, uh, we always invite, challenge you guys to share this service on Facebook. And so as we're uh, gearing up for Romans 11, just take a quick moment to do that on your Facebook. That would uh, be awesome. And then also, um, I, uh, oh, where my, where my notes go? There they are right there. Also, I want to remind you ladies that tomorrow uh, Flourish is happening right here. And it's exciting because we have had more women register for this Flourish than we ever have before. So we're very excited. Yeah, that's right. A uh, little girl power happening. Come on. And uh, so Flourish is happening. If you haven't registered, you still have time. But if you haven't registered, it doesn't mean you can't come. You come, bring your friends with you. It's going to be an awesome night. We're really excited. It's happening right here. And Pastor Chuck's going to remind you guys of this. But also, if you... Uh, if you have time right after this service, we're going to help set up for Flourish. So if you've got a few minutes, you can stay around. We would greatly appreciate that, and uh, they'll let you know what you need to do. And so uh, I want to pray over us, and then we're going to dive into Romans chapter 11 together. So let's pray. Father, I pray that your blessing, your presence, your goodness would be all over this place and with every person who's engaged with us online right now, that you would do immeasurably more in their lives, that God, your word would not return void and that you would work powerfully here and now to save people and sanctify, grow, build up your church. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Once off course in our ways, rerouted and redeemed by an ending grace. We cannot stay stagnant, but we must move forward. One day at a time, one step at a time, into the life we are now called to live, a life lived forward. Let's go. So excited to dive into Romans chapter 11 with you guys. So if you have a Bible with you, turn 
with me to Romans chapter 11. If you don't, the passage will be here on the screen, and it's also there in your notes as well. Romans chapter 11. Now, I want to make a few disclaimers. First, this is one of the most difficult chapters in all of the Bible. Uh, not only to understand, which you're going to see here in just a moment, like, huh, this is interesting. I've never heard some of this stuff before, but also to apply. It's like, how do we, how do we wrap our minds around this? And then like, how does this impact our week this coming week? And so uh, hopefully, and I believe it will, we're going to pull two truths from this passage that I think will be super helpful for you. But as I read this passage this last week, I was reminded of my son. So uh, a few weeks ago, uh, I take our kids to school in the morning, and a few weeks ago, I was with uh, my children. I dropped my daughter off, and so it was just me and my son. And uh, we're driving to the school, and he asked me a question about water. And, uh, you know, we, I started to explain to him the water cycle, that, you know, water falls from the sky, it falls to the earth, it evaporates, and then it goes back up to the clouds, and then some of it is underneath us, and so you've got rivers underneath us, and so water's all over the place, and water never really stops existing, it just always kind of recycles. And I was doing a phenomenal job at explaining the water cycle. So I get to this certain point, and I have just Bill Nye the science guy, this young man, okay? He is just like listening to all these things, and I'm like, okay, I totally crushed that just then. Like, he understands completely now the water cycle. I finish, there's a pause, and my son goes, what? <laughs> what? And he literally said, I, I, so I started explaining some more. I'm like, well, son, here's the deal. Water falls from the clouds, goes to the earth, it evaporates, some of it goes back up, some of it goes in. And so I start explaining it again, and he, and he stops me. He says, Dad, you can just stop. I have no idea what you're talking about. And so I laughed, and I was like, okay, yeah, maybe the water cycle may be too difficult for him to completely comprehend in this moment in his seven-year-old life. But the reason I am sharing that story with you is because I felt that way diving into Romans 11. So I've read Romans 11 multiple times, you know, just throughout the course of my Christian life, but I have never studied it from the purpose of preaching it. And so there's a kind of a different process that takes place when you're going to stand in front of a couple thousand people on a day and share with them about a passage of scripture, a little bit different than just a simple Bible reading. And so I read this and I literally finished it and said, what? <laughs> what? What is going on here? Like, what in the world is taking place in this passage of Scripture? I felt like Peter, uh, one, of my, uh, one of my favorite passages, and Breck's going to make fun of me for this. It's not one of my favorite passages in the sense I'm going to put it in my house. But Paul, uh, excuse me, Peter talks about Paul's writing in 2 Peter. And here's what he says. I, I'm so grateful for the Apostle Peter. Because here's what Peter says about Paul's writing. And also, in all his letters, meaning Paul, Speaking in them of those things in which are some things hard to understand. And I'm like, thank you, Peter. Thank you. He finally said what all of us are thinking, that some of us read some of Paul's writings. And it's like, I don't get this, but I don't want to admit that because then everybody's going to think I'm not a good Christian or whatever. Like, we're like, I don't understand what he's saying here. And so Peter was just like, here's the deal. Paul writes some stuff, and it's difficult for me. Okay, it's really difficult for me to understand. And so I want to go ahead and just start off by saying Romans 11 is difficult. And we're going to lay out some things that are just going to be like, huh, never heard of that before. But I want to make this promise to you, that even though God's Word may be difficult to understand here, no doubt this is applicable for you today and tomorrow and all this week. The two truths that we're going to pull from this passage of Scripture have every bit to do with your life today. The scripture promises us in the book of Isaiah that God's Word will never return void, and I rest, I am assured that his word this morning will continue to fulfill that promise, that it will not return void. And so I want to read to all of us, read with all of us, uh, excuse me, Romans 11, beginning of verse 1, and then we're going to stop at verse uh, 10 and then dive into verse 11 after we look at the first point. But here's what Paul says. He's writing to the church in Rome, and here's what he says, another question he brings to us. I say then, has God not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know that the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? 
Lord. This is, so Paul is quoting the prophet Elijah from the Old Testament. And there was a time period, which we're about to see, where Elijah was in a really, really tough spot. We're going to see what happens here. So here he's quoting Elijah. Elijah is speaking to God from the Old Testament. He's referencing an Old Testament story. And he says, Lord, they have killed your prophets, and they have torn down your altars, and I am alone am left, and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? So Paul is saying, well, how did God respond to Elijah in this moment? Here's how God responded to Elijah from this Old Testament story. God says, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Verse 7, what then? What Israel is seeking, it has not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened, just as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor. He's quoting another passage of Scripture from the Old Testament. Eyes to see not, and ears to hear not, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not, and bend their backs forever." Crystal clear, right? There we go. I want to pray over this, pray over this moment we have, and then we're going to dive into the first truth that we see from this passage of Scripture. Father, the the greatest thing that I can do this morning, and you know this, is to pray. God, I, I, I come before you in humility, preaching as a dying man to dying people, and I pray that, God, your word, as you have already promised, I claim this promise that it would not return void that, God, you would teach and work and save people today. God, there are people here who need to hear these truths in order that they may be born again, go from darkness to light. Lord, I pray that that would take place. And, God, those who are saved, those who are your church this morning, who are hearing this passage of Scripture, God, that they would be encouraged in ways that they have never known they could be spiritually. And I pray all these things in the awesome and good name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The first truth we're going to see this morning from this first section of Scripture is very simply this. God is merciful. God is merciful. So, we need to understand a few things that are going on in this passage before we understand this truth. First off, what Paul has just laid out in Romans chapter 10 is there are going to be people who reject him. They're going to reject Christ. They're not going to follow him. And he's specifically talking about the Israelites. God's chosen people are not all chosen. And so there are some of God's people who are going to reject God, which is like for some people who are reading this, especially in this day and age, are like, that doesn't make sense. In essence, what they're saying is God's plan doesn't look like it's really working out well, that God's chosen people are rejecting him, and so therefore God must have messed up. God must not know what he's doing. And so Paul's addressing that idea and saying, no, 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 no. Not all of Israel has been rejected by God, and he appeals first to his own testimony. Many of you know Paul's story, but many of you may not. Paul was an Israelite, obviously. He was a rabbi, and he was extremely zealous for God. So much so that for a long time, Paul was killing Christians. He was literally murdering people who were following Jesus. That's Paul's story. And what God, what, excuse me, what Paul is saying here is like, no, 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 no. God hasn't rejected his people. I'm one of them. I'm a descendant of Abraham. I'm a descendant of Israel. I'm a part of the Jewish, Jewish nation. And God has not completely rejected his plan. And he gives another example. Not only does he give his own story, but he also gives the story of Ezekiel. And this one's important. So if you've checked out for a second, zoom back in, okay? He gives another, excuse me, not Ezekiel, Elijah. And he gives this story. And in this story about Elijah, okay, see if you can connect with this. In this story about Elijah, Elijah is in a really dark spot. Matter of fact, he's in such a dark spot that the other, he was a prophet, and the other prophets around him were being killed by the Israelites because they were doing what God wanted them to do, and the Israelites, the Jewish people, didn't like it. So they were killing these good prophets and then also killing anybody else who was pursuing God, and they were trying to kill Elijah. And so he's in a really difficult spot. He is terrified. And God reminds him in that moment, as we just read, He reminds Elijah, hey, I know you're in a dark spot, but listen, and you don't know this, you don't see this, but I have reserved for myself 7,000 people 
who have not bowed to the idols, who have not bowed and are worshiping idols. And I want to make a quick point about that. Because what Paul is reminding us here is that just because you cannot see God working does not mean that he's not working. Some of you feel like Elijah. You're in an extremely difficult spot. You're in a dark place. And you feel like just everything is closing in. The world is just completely straying away from God. Our country is straying away from God. Like This is all just awful and terrible. Nothing good is going to come from this generation. Nothing good is going to come from this moment in human history. But the truth is, regardless of what you and I see, God is always at work. God is always working in the midst of the world in ways and in places that you may never see or you won't see for a while. And so what he's reminding us here from this first section is that God's merciful, that he is sovereign. He's working out his plan even when you and I don't see it. Because here's the truth. Some of y'all are in a really dark spot today. I mean, you feel what Elijah felt. People may not be trying to kill you, but they may be trying to hurt you with their words. They may try, be trying to get you fired. They may try, be trying right now to get you cut out of that will or lose in this business deal that you're working on or, or whatever it is. But you feel that pressure, that darkness. But what you need to be reminded this morning, what we need to be reminded of is God is always working around you even when you don't see it or feel it. It's just reminding us here that God working out his plan even when we don't feel it. And he goes on to say that God has saved a group of people, but he has saved this group of people based on something that we really need to land on with this this first truth, by grace. Look what he says here in verse 5 and 6. In the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. Verse 6. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. What Paul is reminding these people here that is so vital for us is that if there are people here who are saved, and if they were saved, they were saved not because they were good people, or they were Jews, or they were nice people, they were saved solely and predominantly and completely by God's grace. And that is a good truth for us this morning, that you and I, those of you who are saved, you are not saved because you could offer something to God. You were not saved because you had good things that you were doing, and so therefore God said, you know what, they're a pretty good person. And I'm going to go ahead and save them. If you are saved this morning, God saved you 100% because of his grace. Not because you earned it, deserved it, or because you had this plea before God and he thought, you know what, I'm going to have pity on this person because I kind of like them. No, here's the God did not like you. God loved you, and he loved you by giving you his grace. He is a God of mercy. We can celebrate that this morning. It creates in us this, this humility before God, because God is a merciful God. It had nothing to do with you. It had everything to do with God. And do you know why? So that when you get saved, some of you that may be today, some of you that may have been two years ago, five years ago, or 50 years ago, at the day you got saved, the glory for that, because it is by grace, goes completely and totally and solely to God. But here's what's beautiful. Here's what's amazing. That same grace that saved you on the day you got saved is the same grace that is holding you now in the hand of God. I've heard people say before that grace is an ocean that you cannot swim out of. Listen, some of you are here this morning and you feel like you're saved, but God has, he's done with you. He's he's run from you. He is away from you, but I promise you, he has not. The cross and the grace is way bigger than your life. It's way bigger than your shame. It's way bigger than your guilt. The grace of God is far wider and deeper than your own life. And every sin and any sin that you have committed, if you are in Christ, his grace is way bigger than you. Way bigger than you. Let me tell you a story about my own life. I was a young man, and um, I grew up in church, but to be honest, church was not that big a thing to me. I didn't necessarily care about it. I went because my parents would go, and you know, my brother and my sister, we all went, but it just wasn't a thing for me. I didn't care. There were more things in life as a young man that I cared about more than church. 
And so uh, a friend of mine one day invited me to a church service on a Wednesday night. I had never been to a church service on a Wednesday night. I thought that was kind of strange. But I was like, yeah, I'll go because they told me that they were going to be serving pizza that night. And I was, uh, I, listen, back in the 90s and uh, where I'm from, I lived in the Delta of Arkansas. So pizza came from like 30 minutes away, okay, like on a on a, on a, on a you know, like a little donkey and a, a covered wagon, okay? So when someone offered pizza, I was like, absolutely. And we had to get it from Pizza Hut because here's the truth, no one out pizzas the hut. But anyway, um, and so I was like, absolutely. I, I, I want to eat pizza at this church service on a Wednesday. Well, wow, okay, great. So I show up at this church service on Wednesday. We walk into the sanctuary. I'd never been there before. And I was like, so uh, well, where's the pizza? And someone told me, one of the youth leaders told me, well, we actually had to cancel that. We're not having pizza tonight. And I was like, of all the low down, dirty ways that churches get people there, it's like, oh, come, we're going to give this to everybody. Sorry, get Jesus instead, okay? And I was like, man, I, so I sat down in this pew, and I was so mad. So as a young man, I was like, I'm going to go home. This is ridiculous. I was so frustrated. So they start the church service, and pastor starts talking, and he's saying things that I've heard before. He's saying things that I knew, you know, stuff about Jesus and my sin and yada, yada, yada. But on that night, in God's sovereign plan, it started to set differently with me. I was listening and, and, and began to realize that what Jesus did was not just a story, but that was actually my story, because that was my whole life. It's like, okay, yeah, that's what Jesus did over there, but I got my own thing going. I got my own life, my own trajectory, my own stuff. And I started to realize, and as I look back, I started to understand that in that moment, the weight of my sin began to just fall on me. I felt heavy. I felt convicted. I felt this pain in my stomach, in my chest, like, man, there's something wrong with me. There is something not right with me before God, because up until that point, I thought me and God were fine. I showed up at church. We were good. But I realized that I was not right with God. That I had this, this sin, this weight on me that I couldn't let loose of. And the preacher wasn't a hellfire and brimstone type preacher. He was a nice man, loved the Lord, preached gently, preached Jesus. And at the end of the service, he very simply said, and if you're here this morning, or excuse me, this evening, and you know that you need to give your life to Jesus. You know that you need to be saved. I'm going to invite you just to come forward. I knew no one in that church. And up until that point, I was mad at all of them because none of them had pizza. But I walked forward during that invitation, not knowing a soul as a young man, tears filled with my eyes. I can take you back to the pew that I was sitting in when I got up. I walked forward. I looked at that preacher that I didn't know from Adam. And I said, I, I, I want to know about how to be saved. And he sat me down and, and finished the service, and then he sat there with me and explained to me that Christ loves me, that I needed to admit that I was a sinner before Jesus and believe in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection in my heart and confess him as Lord. And so we prayed right there at the, that pew. And on that day, I gave my life to Jesus and was saved. It was never the same. And I tell you that story to help you realize and understand that was not because one day I was going to become a preacher. I did not think that. That's not because I was a good kid. It's not because I was from a good family. It's not because I grew up in church. The reason God saved me was 100% all because of his grace and mercy to a little punk kid down in the Delta of Arkansas who didn't deserve anything but hell. He showed himself merciful. And I want to share something with you after that because here's the truth. Here's the behind the scenes view of my life, my story. It was after I got saved not before it, but after it, that I, make the, I made the biggest mistakes of my life. You know, you hear some people say, like, I was a drug addict and, and a drunk and all these other things, and then I got saved, and man, God just cleaned me up, and praise God for that. That's, that is so awesome that that's so many people's stories, but that's not mine. Man, I got saved and then, then made a lot of really bad decisions after that. But here's what I want to share with you this morning. Not only did God's grace save me, but God's grace never left me. Even in my worst moments and the things that I'm so ashamed of, God's grace never left me. He is a God of mercy. And not just mercy to save you, but listen to this. His mercy is not just big enough to save you. His mercy is big enough to stay with you. He is a God of mercy. 
And the second truth that we see this morning from a very difficult passage of Scripture is that not only is God merciful, but God is mysterious. God is mysterious. Now, you may have looked at this first half and been like, that wasn't that hard to understand. That, that makes some sense. I understand those things. I didn't understand everything, but it makes sense. Well, join with me in verse 11 through 16 if you really felt like you understood those things. Verse 11. Here's what Paul says. It continues. I say then that they did not stump. They did not stumble. I can't even. St- I'm stumbling through stumble. I'm sorry. <laughs> They did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? But I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I'm an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry, verse 14, if somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is holy. But if the root is holy, the branches are too. Now, let me just explain to you what's happening. So Paul has just, in the first half of that we just read, in that first block, Paul helps us understand that there were some Israelites who were hardened So God hardened their hearts so that they would not come to know Jesus. And he quotes a couple of Old Testament passages to prove that. So the question then is, why did he do that? Why in the world would God harden someone's heart so that they would not respond to Jesus? Like, why in the world would that take place? Well, Paul gives us the answer here. You ready for the answer? Here's what he says. He says, they harden their hearts, verse, verse 11, but by their transgression, meaning their hardening of their own heart, their rejection of Jesus, that's sin. So when you and I decide, I don't want Jesus, I want to live for me, God calls that sin. So, but by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles. I'm going to pause right there. What? So what, what Paul is helping us understand is God stiff arms Israel, okay? He hardens their heart, some of these religious people, so that the Gentiles, you and me, all of us, we're all Gentiles. Unless you are 100% Jewish from the Jewish nation, you're a Gentile. That's like me. God hardens Israel's heart, some of them, so that Gentiles, you and me, can enter into the kingdom of God. He literally like holds the door open in front of Israel's face, and they're like, okay. You ever had that moment happen where like so much opens the door and they just hold it, and you're like, okay, hi, I'm, I'm right here. He's doing that to Israel, hardening their hearts so that you and I can come into the kingdom of God, so that you and I can be saved. And here's why. If that doesn't make sense to you, here's why God does it. Listen to this. Look, it says right here, to make Israel jealous. What? So God is hardening this group of people's hearts so that you and I can come into the kingdom of God. And the reason he's doing that is just so that the people whose hearts are hardened will look at you and me who are enjoying the full benefits of salvation in Christ. The reason he's doing that is to make them jealous. Makes complete sense, doesn't it? Like we don't, we, there's no, we don't talk about that. Like that, that makes no sense to us. Like it is wild. And then he goes on, Paul makes it even more personal. Paul not only gives this illustration, help us understand, but then Paul says, hey, listen, and this is what I do with my own ministry. Here's what I'm doing. I am magnifying, he says that word, I'm magnifying my ministry if somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen, the Israelites, and save some of them. So here's what Paul's saying. I'm being a little passive aggressive in what I'm presenting to everyone of what God is doing through the Gentiles. And the reason why is so that the Israelites will be saved. Like it would be in our context, like the idea of someone like subtweeting somebody. Ever seen somebody do that? Where somebody tweets something and they're talking very clearly about somebody else, but they never say who they are. You know, it's kind of a passive aggressive thing. We do, you see it on Facebook too. Like if there were somebody who lived across the street from me that would not keep their dog from barking at 6 a.m. in the morning, I would really appreciate it. No one intended. I'm just saying that would bother me if it would happen. Well, obviously, we know what's happening. There's somebody across the street whose dog's barking, and you are frustrated about it, but you don't want to say it because you're a Christian, right? And it's so much better as a Christian to be passive-aggressive on social media than to simply go across the street and say, hey, your dog's waking me up. Could you please keep it down? 
That's what he's doing. Paul is saying, I'm being a little passive aggressive about what God is doing with the Gentiles. And the reason why is so that the Israelites will get jealous. That makes no sense to us. And I'm here to tell you this morning, I understand this, but I do not understand this, why God is doing this. But here's what I do understand. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. That's why this truth we're looking at right here is that God is mysterious. Now let's bring that back to your own life. There are things happening in your own life right now in this season that make no sense. You're looking at the landscape of your life and you're just scratching your head like, really God? Like this is, this is your plan? Like th this, 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 is, this is what you wanted for me? This situation that I'm in right now is, is a part of your plan? And what God is communicating through this passage of Scripture is He always has a plan. It won't always make sense to us. And the truth is still the same for you and I today. God is a God of mystery. And He is allowing or working in situations in your life that do not make sense sense. They don't. Small situations, large situations, but the truth is he is still in control. Does it make sense to us why he's hardening the hearts of Israel so that, or Israelites so that people can get saved and ultimately to make them jealous? Does that make sense to us? Absolutely not. Would we do it the same way? Probably not. I don't know. More than likely not. But we're not God. Thank God that we're not God. Man. So the truth that we need to understand this morning from this passage, or from the back half of this passage is, God is at work in our lives, and we will not fully understand it. I've told you guys before, and I'm going to invite the band back up as we bring all this together this morning, but I've told you guys this before. If you can understand everything about God, He will cease to be God. If you serve and worship a God that makes total sense to you, that fits in this perfect, seamless, squared off box, and he completely and totally makes sense to you, then he is not God. That is a God that you have made up because ultimately what you are declaring is you are God because you figured out or you know how God works. The truth is, we do not know how God works. There are times that he does things and says things and allows things that just don't make sense to us in the moment, may not make sense to us in 20 years, but I promise you, he is in control. He is working out a plan in your life. He is drawing some of you to himself to be saved today. He is working in the midst of your hearts and life and your situation financially, in the situation with your family, your children. He is sovereignly working all of those things out. Why? Because he is a God not only of love, Love and simplicity, but he is a God of mystery. Amen. How beautiful our God is that a four-year-old can understand that he loves them and someone who lives a thousand lifetimes can still not completely comprehend what he's doing and how he does it. He is a God of mercy and mystery. I'm going to share with you a story to bring all this together this morning. So I've been a, a pastor at Central for 11 years, and for the majority of those years thus far, uh, I was a student pastor. And one of the privileges and responsibilities that I had as a student pastor is I took students on mission trips. And so our junior high students would go on a mission trip somewhere in the United States. And then our senior high students got the opportunity to go on a mission trip overseas somewhere. And so this particular year, we were taking our students to the country of Belize. I was so proud. This is a side note. I didn't tell 930, but, you know, I'm, I'm totally against, like, those T-shirts that everybody wears on a mission trip, you know, like where they're all, it's like, oh, there they are, and they're all walking. But on that year, this shirt, we, we said on there, we Belize. I'm so proud of that. So proud of that. We Belize. I wore that thing in the airport. Anyway. So we went to Belize, and I took with us a couple of our student interns. So they were like college students who were helping us and felt called to ministry. So what we did once we got to Belize is we kind of broke up our group into two sections, and one group worked with a church in one area, and another group worked with a church in another area. And then we'd kind of come back together at night and celebrate and have fun and do all kinds of stuff. 
Matter of fact, we did some pretty crazy stuff that trip. I swam with sharks. I caught alligators. It was wild. Yeah. That's what happens when you go on a mission trip with me. We swim with sharks and catch alligators at night. It was fun. Um, so, Spencer was one of my interns who went on another trip to another side of the community that we were in. And so Spencer came to me uh, one night after we had finished kind of a, a service. So what we do is we'd serve the church in the morning and then have a church service at night. And so after that church service at night, Spencer comes to me and he looks like he's seen a ghost. And he's just like, hey, hey I, I, I've got to tell you this story right now. What happened? I was like, all right, sweet. What's up, man? What happened? And he said, I had a guy today come up to me, a young man, about 20 years old. He came up to me and he looked at me and he looked at me and just was smiling. And he was like, I thought he was like off or something. I don't know what was going on. So the guy walked up to him. The interpreter came with this guy. And the guy looked at Spencer and he said, I need to talk to you. And Spencer was like, you know, okay. And the young man said, a few nights in a row, I have had a dream. And in that dream, a man dressed in all white, and I can't see his face, but he's, he's so bright. I don't know who he is. He has told me in this dream multiple times that there's going to be a white man who comes to me and shares with me the good news. And he looks at Spencer and he says, what is this good news? He says, because God has shown me you in my dream that you're supposed to tell me some good news. And Spencer is just blown away. The interpreter who's interpreting the story is just like, what is going on? And so Spencer sits down with this young man. And he shares with him about Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ loves him, that Jesus Christ died for him on the cross, he was buried, he resurrected from the grave to destroy his sin and his death, and that Jesus desires for that young man to be saved. And the young man looked at him and said, what must I do to be saved? And so there, in Belize, our student intern, Spencer, leads this young man to Christ and he gets saved. Yeah, we can celebrate that. And he shows up that night and he's like, Blake, you, this is crazy. I've never seen anything like this. This is wild. So, man, it is. We both just celebrated, worshiped the Lord, praised God, shared it with our students. It was an awesome, awesome story. Here's why I tell that story. Because there's two truths we see in that story that I think perfectly summarize this passage. Number one, that God's merciful. That he's a God of grace. That he wanted to save this young man in Belize, this 20-year-old kid, so desperately that he sends this dream about Jesus and telling him that someone's going to share with him the good news of Christ, that, and he gets saved. He literally displays his mercy and his grace because what that young man deserved was hell, but what that young man got that day was every blessing and privilege of heaven. He got Christ. He was saved. And so God displays he is a merciful God. And he's still doing that. He's doing it here. He's doing it all over this region and all over the world. God is not done. He's not finished. He is continually displaying that he's a God of mercy. But also, he displays the second truth, that he is a God of mystery. None of us drew that up. None of us got there and thought, you know what? There's going to be a kid come up to us and start dreaming weird dreams about white people coming to him, telling him good news. That's going to happen. I just feel it. Let's plan for that. We didn't plan for that at all. This was just this wild, awesome story. A mystery that none of us could have predicted until we got there. Listen, friends. God is a God of mercy. And God is a God of mystery. So this morning, some of you may be here and you've never given your life to Jesus. You've never surrendered to his mercy for you. He wants to save you. He wants you to be his child, his son or his daughter. And so I'm going to invite everyone here this morning to bow their heads, close their eyes, simply as we bring this sermon together, bring this service together. Some of you are here and you know you felt like I did that day I went to that church. You know that if you died today, you'd spend eternity separated from God in hell. You know that you're lost. And you know that you don't know Christ. You know about Him. You know all the stuff He did. You just don't know Him. He doesn't know you. But listen, you need to know something. He's a God of mercy. He wants to save you today. He will save you today. And so if you're here this morning and you know that you need to be saved, your relationship with Jesus needs to start today, then I'm going to invite you 
to do what Romans 10, 13 tells us to do. Romans 10, 13 says, everyone, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Some of you are here and you need to call on the Lord and ask Him to save you today. You're like me that day at First Baptist Church Marvel. And so if you're ready to be saved, you're ready to give your life to Jesus, I want to ask you three simple questions that I want you to answer in your heart. The first question is this. Do you believe that you have sinned against God and that you deserve hell? Do you believe that? The second question is, do you believe that God sent Jesus Christ to die for your sins? And do you believe in your heart that he was resurrected from the grave? Yes or no? And then the third question is this. Are you ready to confess Christ as Lord, to repent of your sins, and to follow Jesus? Are you ready for that? And if you're here this morning and you answered yes to all three of those questions, then I'm going to invite you now to pray this prayer with me. It's not a magic prayer, and you can pray something like it. You don't have to get every word right. But if you're ready to give your life to Jesus, I'm going to invite you to call on the Lord now and ask Him to save you. And so you pray something like this with me to the Father. God, I know that I've sinned against you. And I know that I deserve hell. But I believe in my heart that you sent Jesus Christ to die for my sins. I believe he was buried. And I believe he rose again with all my heart. And now I'm confessing Jesus as Lord, repenting of my sins, and putting my trust in Christ. God, thank you for saving me today. And I pray that you would use me to build your kingdom all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, listen, if you prayed that this morning, we want to know about it. We celebrated this morning a young lady who got baptized. Man, we want to celebrate that with you. And so if you gave your life to Christ, we invite you to come forward to let us know that like I did when I was a young man. You come and talk to one of the pastors, one of us. Maybe some of you are here and you're like, look, like I'm saved. I know that I am. But man, I've never been baptized. Like I've just never publicly displayed what Jesus has done personally in my life. And so I want to invite you. Come on. You can leave here soaked or we can set up your baptism. But don't leave here not right with Christ. And for those of you who are saved, you're baptized, man, I want to encourage you. Your God, He's a God of mercy. You cannot run His mercy. He's got you. He's a God of mystery. And you may not understand all that He's doing in your life, but trust Him. He's got a plan. He's got a pretty proven track record. He knows what He's doing. If He's created you and saved you, He'll bring you to the end. Just hold on. Hold on. And so as Eric leads us in worship now, uh, I thought it was Caleb up here. As long as Eric leads us in worship, you celebrate and worship God. Maybe you need to come forward to pray. You respond to Christ how he's leading you. I'll pray over us and then you respond. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of Christ. We thank you that you're a God of mercy and a God of mystery. And so, Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you'd break through. God, break through the wall that's in our church right now. God, you'd help us just to, just to let loose, to get right with Jesus. Help us to stop playing church and help us to be the kingdom of God here. God, I pray that you would do an eternal work right now. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm about you to stand. Eric's going to lead us in worship. You can respond.